everybody welcome back to the future in space hangout sponsored by the american astronautical society i am really glad that we are back doing these things today and i think you're really gonna like this hangout because one of the things i've learned about i read, I read a lot of polls and i and i try to understand a lot about what people think nasa should be doing and all americans think that nasa should be looking should be doing above anything else it should be doing studying the climate change of the earth and protecting Earth from potentially hazardous asteroids. Everything else is a distant third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, all the way down, right? So these are the top two things that Americans think NASA should be doing. And today we're gonna to talk about the second one, protecting us from asteroids. And, and, I, and I'm laughing because you're not gonna believe what these guys are gonna be doing. Today we're gonna to be talking about the double asteroid redirection test or DART mission because NASA loves acronyms and DART's a lot easier to say double asteroid redirection test there's a lot in there so we're going to be talking with members of the team uh, which is launching later this month this mission uh to help protect us from asteroids and we're going to find out what, how they do that and what they're planning on doing uh what they're planning on learning from this this episode uh, from this particular mission but before i bring up my my panel i just want to say real quick i'm streaming on twitch twitter youtube channels uh, both deep astronomy and the american astronautical society and facebook so and I've, i am congregating and aggregating all of the chats from those platforms into one spot so we hope you will interact with us leave us questions and if you're on youtube if you use i think it's colon q u a big red question mark pops up um and i can see it easier if it's a question so and i'll and i'll i'll bring it up with my uh with my panel so let me bring up my cohorts my co-guests here by the way i want to also thank the american astronautical society for bringing these to you these are i think amazing uh opportunities for the general public to learn what, what's going on with members of the american astronautical society uh okay so uh with me today <clears throat> i've got two members of the dart team here we tried to have elena adams with us but she we had some uh we had some connection issues because she's busy getting ready for the launch but with me today is uh Deepak Srinivasan. he's right next to me right oops right over there <laughs> I don't know what you know doing this now uh he's the dart um uh or, i'm sorry he works at uh johns hopkins applied physics lab he at the civil space division so welcome deepak it's good to have you also Thank with you. me is uh, andy rifkin he's the dart investigation team lead hi hey okay so dart first of all this thing's launching soon right you guys are getting ready for launch it's imminent that's right yeah that's right Just a couple of weeks from now Couple nights before Thanksgiving, actually. So teams gearing up for a very, probably not so relaxing Thanksgiving weekend, but a, certainly an exciting <laughs> Thanksgiving weekend. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Is it going from Florida or uh, uh, somewhere else? We'll be launching out of Vandenberg Space Force Vandenberg. Base out in California, actually, and that's actually where where Lena is right now. Hopefully, she was trying to join us for this call, but we're busy launching a spacecraft, and things happen, of course. Yeah, I, I'm not going to take it personally. I uh, wish she could be here, though. But she is the, <laughs> Alina Adams was the, is the uh, DART mission systems engineer, so she could not connect to us uh, here today. So, uh, but we, we do have everyone else. Okay, so uh, I don't know who wants to give, give us some background. Should it be, uh, sh should it be Deepak or Andy? Which one of you? Well, and I think if you want I, to bring up the slides or bring up the slides and just let me know. Yeah, why don't you go ahead and bring up a slide or two and, and we'll talk to that and I'll give you a little bit of background of who we are and what we're trying to accomplish and why we're trying to accomplish it. Let me... And then, yeah, if you can go all the way to the beginning of those charts, that'll be helpful. And then, right. and so what'll, what'll happen is that I'll talk a little about why we're doing what we're doing, and then Andy's going to jump in and tell you exactly how we're going to accomplish that. So if you can go to the sure. next chart. Okay. So just really quickly, I wanted to make sure you all understood who we were. So thank you for that excellent introduction, Tony. Uh, so both Andy and I work at the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory. So we have roughly 7,500 people working with us, out of which about one, a little bit more than one fifth of us work in space or work on space programs, I should say. We're all terrestrially bound. Um, this, this chart that you see here is actually a, a, a group of all the spacecraft that we've built over the last literally 75 years in doing this. And we've done a whole bunch of different spacecraft. Uh, just a couple of years ago, we launched a, a very bold mission called Parker Solar Probe which is actually yeah. diving into the sun's atmosphere. Uh, getting measured, yeah, it was, it's, it's, a, it's a 
Audacious mission has been on the books for decades, and we finally had the technology catch up to enable us to actually pull this mission off, where we're actually diving into the sun's corona, the sun's atmosphere, so we can learn about how our sun works from a vantage point that's never been accessed before. So that, so that was something that we launched just a couple of years ago in 2018, and it's, it's already been diving through the sun's atmosphere doing repeated flybys. And contrasting that, there's another mission that we launched called uh, New Horizons, which back in 2015 passed by Pluto and right now is continuing its journey through the Kuiper belt and on its way out of our solar system. So you can tell that we've run the gamut from towards the sun as well as out of the solar system and you see all these places in between. Can you go to the next chart, Tony? Yeah. But today, what we wanted to talk about is what you see here. You know, this is a iconic photograph that may, many of you might recognize, some of you might not. So this photograph is actually taken back in 1968, which was a historically a very tumultuous year for, for the United States. There was a lot of, a lot of things wrong with that year. Uh, Martin Luther King was assassinated. There was a lot of civil unrest. We had riots in DC. And it was a, a very difficult year for Americans and, and truly around the entire world. But then right at the very tail end of the year, Apollo 8 launched, uh, one of the most iconic missions that NASA has ever done. And as, as the spacecraft was whizzing around the moon, first time this ever been done, a uh, fellow engineer and astronaut, William Anders, snapped this picture, called, which, which is called Earthrise. First color picture of Earth taken by a, an astronaut that, that when it came back to Earth, it really lent a sense of hope and inspiration to everybody around the world. And that's how one of the most tumultuous years in American history closed out with, with this symbol. Of, of hope and inspiration that, hey, we, we can do better, we can be better. And I kind of think that, you know, history tends to repeat itself and we're here right now. It's been a very tumultuous couple of years for a lot of people for a lot of different reasons, right? But one of the things that we can all be proud of, and if you're on this call, you you have an interest in space or you work in space, but if you look around the world as well as in our own country, you know, across science and commercial sectors, there has been just a renaissance of activities and just a boom in space. Lots of excitement and something that we can all be proud of. And, you know, it, it's something that I personally am, am extremely proud of. And it, again, we're trying to see what the, whether or not space can lend that sense of hope and inspiration that it has been doing. And I think it indeed has. But it's all happening right here on this planet, planet Earth. And it's a planet that we, we have to work on protecting. Now, space is is not a very safe place. There are dangers there. And you know, Tony's t-shirt is one of them. You know, you have the sun, it's not really Pac-Man eating all the planets as, as indicated on his shirt. But you know, the sun is actually a source of, of uh, a lot of danger for us. It's constantly spewing out the solar wind. And every once in a while, it, there's coronal mass ejections that, it, that where the sun ejects a whole bunch of radiation at our planet, which sometimes could overwhelm some of our spaceborne and ground-based assets. So we have to protect against that. But another thing that's also out in space is, you can hit the next chart, please, Tony, is asteroids. And that's what we're, that's what we're here to talk about today. Now, people talk about, well, asteroids, how often does, does this happen? Well, this chart is showing a bunch of fireballs that where asteroids have actually come and hit Earth or, or burned up in the atmosphere uh, since 1988. So there, there's this is just since 1988, and these are asteroids that are above a certain level. If you include the, like the really small guys that are hitting us nearly every day, this this entire chart would be filled. Yeah. But th there's just I'm sorry, I thought I heard a little bit of feedback there. So here you're seeing that asteroids are hitting us all the time. In fact, I pulled this chart just a couple, a few I'm, days I'm, ago. I'm going inter to interrupt you for just a minute. I'm sorry, but I, uh, Elena just joined. And um, if I leave this screen, it's going to do this. So <laughs> I need to um, do this. And there's, I think that's Elena. Elena, that you, is you've, Elena. Re you've rescued me from having to do the engineering part. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Can, there um, you can you guys are. hear me? Now we, we can, can hear you. We can hear you and ah. see you. <laughs> yes. Wonderful. Thank you. All right. This it is the, the first of many project. wonderful things. Yeah, the first of many wonderful things that the DART mission is going to pull off right now is that we can we can communicate from California to the East Coast. All right, we got that down. Now. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's always yeah. hard. Okay, this is great. Right. Okay, I'll, I will turn up some lights here. All right. All right. So, Thanks, um, Lena. Thank you, just, 
just a sec. Let me, uh, so let me go back to, the minute I move my uh, cursor, it, 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 for some reason, it goes into that kind of um, mode. So I have to go and do this. You're looking at my desktop right That's now. That's okay. We, we get to see under the hood as to how all the magic happens, right? That's right. You're looking so, at my... This, this, is the fun, this is the fun stuff. Okay. There we go. So... All right. So now we're back to asteroids, and now we have our mission system engineer joining us as well, which is... Which is yes, just Elena fantastic. Adams. Elena Adams. So what I was saying is that asteroids, is, as I can see in the chat, you guys are kind of surprised. It's, they're hitting us all the time. So I, I pulled this chart just a few days ago, and the latest one actually hit towards the end of October. It's one of those little circles off the east coast of Somalia. So that burned up in the atmosphere uh, on the last week of October. You know, no, no harm, no foul. But the point here is that these are happening all the time. Can you go to the next chart? So now we want to find out and we want to just talk about what kind of danger do these things pose. Now, this is a big chart with a whole bunch of words. You don't need to look at the words. What I wanted to show you, well, the, the intent of this is, to, is pretty intuitive, right? The bigger the asteroid, you know, that's, that's further to the left or to the right on this chart. You know, the bigger the asteroid, the more damage. The smaller the asteroid, the less damage. You know, it doesn't, that's not a hard concept to understand there. Uh, th what I wanted to really focus on is actually the bottom part of this chart. So the really large asteroids, the one that can, you know, uh, like the ones that uh, that killed all the dinosaurs, made them go extinct. That's that class of asteroid are is so large that uh, there's very few of them that, that our models say are in the in the solar system. And we think we've found all of those. We know that we're safe from these, you know, dinosaur killer level asteroids. Now, conversely, on the other end of the chart, we have we have so many little itty bitty asteroids. But you can see across the bottom, we've found very, very few of them. But that's okay, because those will just burn up in the atmosphere and they're not going to hurt us at all. What we really care about are these asteroids that are in this middle category. These are the ones that can generate, that can cause kind of regional damage. Like if one were to explode over a populated area or, or impact a populated area, you would have widespread damage, but local to that area. It wouldn't be civilization ending, but it could cause some serious damage and, you know, have very dangerous effects on, on you know, how we live our lives. Now, the, across the bottom, you can see that we have not yet identified all of these. So that's why this, this class of asteroid, roughly you know, 10 to 15 meters up to 100 meters in size, those are the ones that we care about the most. Now, if we go to the next chart, we can see why we care about that. So if you rewind the clock about 50,000 years, uh, we have this, this crater that was created in, in, uh, in it was the so-called meteor crater about 40 miles uh, east of Flagstaff, Arizona. You can see it caused a crater that's roughly a little bit more than a kilometer wide, but you can see the devastation that it caused. So at the time of impact, and like I said, this is 50,000 years ago, so none of us were around, but within a 10 kilometer radius, that's the fireball. What happened as soon as that impact happened, within 10 kilometers, everything is pretty much incinerated. If you go out to 24 kilometers, you have heavy winds, you have heavy damage, and then as you get further and further, the damage gets lesser and lesser. So this is the kind of thing that I'm talking about when I said regional damage. It can, this is pretty bad. So if you go to the next chart, I wanted to superimpose this onto DC. What if this were to happen here? You know, and for those of you that are close to DC, this, this is what the, what the damage would look like. You can see that DC falls entirely within that fireball area. So that would be, it would be completely wiped out. And then a good amount of Maryland and Virginia would also uh, suffer cataclysmic winds and lots of property damage and probably loss of life as well. And just to give you a sense of a scale, that's the, the tidal basin. If any of you guys have visited the Washington Monument, that's roughly the same size as the crater that was on the previous chart. So you would see a crater roughly that, that size. Let's go to the so next chart. That area is vaporized? Everything in the, the pretty much fireball. everything in the red, you, you, don't, you don't want to be there. You're inside that fireball. I mean, there might be some in, like remnants of buildings that are left over, but it's that's yeah. not a place that you, you could. Want. You could look at it this way. I was just talking about this last night with someone. Sorry to bust in. Something 160 meters in size or so, if it hit the earth, would have the same energy as um, a 75 megaton nuclear bomb without the radiation. So the largest nuclear weapon ever tested was a 50 megaton one by the Soviets sometime in the 80s, I guess. So this would be 50% worse in terms of the energy expended. So there you go. 
Wow. Yeah, so that's what I was saying. We, we care about this class of asteroid because we haven't found all of them yet. And as Andy just eloquently described, the damage is, is substantive. So let's go to the next chart. Next chart talks about what we're doing about this. So back in 2018, uh, the United States government, we, we put out this plan as to how we wanted to, to deal with this threat, right? So how does the strategy work? If there was an asteroid that was detected out there, there'd be a multitude of different agencies involved. And this plan kind of binds all those agencies together and talks about, you know, what is NASA responsible for? What is, what is the Air Force at the time, now Space Force and U.S. Space Command, what are they responsible for? What is FEMA responsible for? And that's all collected here. So we do have a plan if this were to happen. Now, the plan has five thrust areas. The first goal is detection, tracking, and characterization. We can't really do much about asteroids unless we know where they are. So that's why we have a mission in formulation called, uh, called the Near-Earth Object Surveillance Mission, which is going to hopefully launch uh, later this decade and actually do a survey and try to find all those asteroids that, that I showed you before that we didn't know about yet. So we, you know, before we can mitigate these asteroids, we have to find them first. So that's goal one. Uh, goal two talks about modeling and information integration. Here we want to make sure that we understand what the impact scenarios are going to look like. How does the information flow from place to place to figure out the best way of mitigating uh, such a disaster? Goal three, I'm going to skip over for a second. Uh, goal four is the international cooperation aspect of things. So, you know, most asteroids that we know of are blissfully unaware of political boundaries, right? So any kind of asteroid threat is certainly an international issue. So we need to make sure that all of our uh, all of our you know neighbors that we share this planet with we're all on the same page and we all understand what each other's roles are and how we communicate information back and forth so that's what goal four is and goal five is actually to exercise all of the protocols that we've defined already and interestingly enough that's another thing that we're going to be doing in february of this year where we're going to be bringing in uh, here at APL, we're going to be bringing in a lot of representatives from agencies such as the Department of State, Space Force, NASA, FEMA, and, and other relevant agencies, and actually simulate an asteroid strike scenario and test our own protocols to see whether or not we're, we're up for the task. As we all, you know, remember over the last year when we had the whole pandemic response, you know, there is a national plan as to how to deal with pandemics. But sometimes things don't go according to plan, right? There's all sorts of new things that creep up, social media, fake news, you know, who knows what. And sometimes even the best protocols that we could think of, we find weaknesses in them. So that's what that's what uh, goal five is all about. Let's, you know, we have a great plan. Let's stress out that plan and see whether we are indeed prepared. Now I'm going to rewind a little bit back to goal number three. This is neo detection, or excuse me, deflection and disruption and mitigation. So if we did find an asteroid that was on the way on the way to hit Earth. What do we do about it? You know, there's a whole series of actions that we could take, and one action that we are testing right now is the deflection method. And if you hit the next slide, Dart. And as you said, this is the double asteroid redirection test. And at this point in time, I'm going to hand it off over to Andy, and he's going to dive into what Dart is all about. Okay, hang hang on just a quick second because I got a question I need to ask. Um, so. It. When you say, this is based on your part, what you just said, when you say that you, we know where all of them are, when I go back to that slide and I say, you know, you know where 100% of the 10,000 the, 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 the very we, big we ones, we know where they are. Right. Yeah. And then, and then we only know about 90% of the ones that can cause, I love how you wrote, you phrased it in the, in the slide, possible civilization collapse. Uh, you know, that one, we only know 90%. Well, how do you know what you don't know? How can you say, well, we found them all. How do you? Well, we have models. Know? Okay, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Based on our, our models of how the solar system forms, we have ideas as to how many uh, asteroids we'd find at different sizes. What sh what should the population be? And, and it you know should fall off. You know, we should have a few super large ones, then we should have or excuse me, a few super large ones, and then a lots of smaller ones. And these are models that have been tried and true on on how the solar system is formed. So these are estimates. Right, so when we say ninety percent, that's not an exact number. We think it's going to be about that, based on our own models. Yeah, you but can, you, you can also imagine because uh, maybe this will also help. Um, you can also imagine if you had a jar 
and you numbered, had a whole bunch of marbles in there, and you numbered the marbles, and you pull them out, and you go, okay, this is number 14, and you put it back in, and you pull out the next one, here's number 72, and you put it back in, and you keep doing that, eventually, you're going to pull out the same numbers again and again, and you can use that to say, okay, I can estimate how many marbles could possibly be left, because I'm only pulling out new ones very rarely. So that combined with the kind of models that Deepak is, is Deepak's talking about means that you can kind of mathematically figure out, okay, we, we don't know the exact number, but we're seeing some of these things often enough and repeatedly and not finding new ones. So we must be pretty close to the end. Oh, that's interesting. So using your analogy, so we, we have a jar of marbles and each one's identical. Once you start pulling out so what you're saying is we are observing a great many asteroids and we're observing very fewer and fewer new ones in that so we, size range in that size range and so we can estimate how many we think we've got based on how many new ones we keep observing exactly exactly we're, we're watching the, the sky yep the deepak is the deepak is talking about is also giving us some idea of how many should be in there because i'm well, sorry but if you're wrong by one <laughs> You know, you know, it can it could be a bad day for us. So I just I just wonder how you know you got them all. I guess was my. my yeah, that's a fair question. And after we've been observing long enough that there are only so many places where these can hide, you know, okay. where where we we would have we would have caught them. Okay. So we feel pretty good. All right, all right. I'll get back to the slides. Then I just wanted to uh, wanted to see about that. Okay, go ahead. Um, who wants to go next? This is where we are now. Uh, yeah, I think I think I jump in at this point. Okay. So, um, and the questions are great, so I'll try not to dwell on, on, on me talking. Um, so this is the DART mission. This is an overview of the mission. Um, it shows the, the DART spacecraft there. It shows our, our companion, the Leech Cube CubeSat, which we're going to deploy uh, something like a week ahead of time, maybe 10 days before arrival. Uh, our arrival at Demorphos is going to be a rapid one. It's going to be a, a very, very fast landing. So to speak, uh, we're going to uh, come in at something like six and a half kilometers a second. Uh, you can see the details uh, of the, the mass uh, for the spacecraft there. We are going to go to a double asteroid system. That's the DA in, in DART. Uh, Demorphos is the satellite. It's about 160 meters across, which is why we mentioned 160 meters a few times uh, in this talk. Um, and it's orbiting a larger object, the 780 meter Didymos. Um, we know Demorphos is orbiting uh, Didymos once every 11.92 hours or so. We know that the two of them are separated by uh, only a little over a, a kilometer from center to center, and less than a kilometer if you go from surface to surface. Um, once the impact occurs, we're going to make measurements of what happened from the Earth. That's, that's down there on the lower left. Uh, all of this is going to occur at seven hundredths of an astronomical unit, or a little under seven million miles from Earth uh, when it occurs. And then that upper right uh, basically uh, has the bullets that that's what we're going to do. We're targeting the binary Didymo system. We're going to impact the Morphos. We're going to change its orbital period. And then we're going to measure what we did from Earth. Well, you sound very uh, sure that you're going to change the orbital period. <laughs> uh, if we, as long as we hit it, we're, I mean, physics is physics. You know, if, if we don't change the orbital period, then there's someone's going to get a Nobel Prize out of it. Is, well, you know, there's something we don't uh, understand about gravity at large scales. So, yeah, uh, so <laughs> if you're, uh, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Yeah. No, so the so the next uh, slide there, um, again, I'm kind of shows. To I'm, I'm sorry to do oh, this. Not at all. There's an artifact from my screen. I just need to. Uh, I have to start from a different spot. There, it's gone now. Okay. Go okay. ahead. Yeah. So this uh, shows now instead of coming in from the left, we're kind of coming in from the lower right, but shows the overall situation. We are going to hit Demorphos. We're going to hit it head on. Uh, that takes a little bit of energy out of uh, out of the orbit of Demorphos. It drops it into a slightly lower orbit, um, which is which is uh, what's shown here. That slightly lower orbit has a different orbit period. We're going to measure the difference. Uh, I'll talk about a, a little more of the details in a slide or two. I believe the next slide should be in. Uh, well, it is an animation. Whether it's animated or not, I guess is going to yep, be. It will. It'll go. There it goes. Good. Uh, so the inner circle there, and these are even labeled, there's Earth. The outer one is Didymos, uh, the Didymos system with Demorphos orbiting it. Uh, DART itself is about to launch in this animation. It stays very close to Earth 
uh, as these things go, it passes outside of Earth, and then everything will arrive in pretty close to the same location um, in October of 2022. So um, it, Didymos is not a threat to Earth. The Didymos, Didymos's orbit does not inter, intersect that of Earth's. Um, so um, we're not going to do anything to change any of those facts. Uh, but Didymos is going to be close to Earth when DART hits it. And so we're we'll okay. going to make these measurements. I've I paused it here just because things get interesting. So when we're all clumped together like this, and it, there's not a date, so I guess this is near the collision time. It's gonna be near, yeah, it's gonna be next fall. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, you're saying it's not. So Didymos does not cross the path of. Oh, I see it. I can see it in the animation. It does yep. not cross the path of the Earth. So there's not going to be any. There's how, no how, danger. No. What's the minimum distance it'll get from us? Um. Something like a, a little under seven million miles this uh, this time around. It it does sometimes get a little closer, but not super close. Not much closer than that. A lot of other asteroids get a lot closer. Oh yeah, um, Apophis is going to go underneath uh, the geosynchronous satellites. So yep, yeah, Apophis is going to come close, and that that's also true. This is a two dimensional um, depiction of a three dimensional situation. So that's that's yeah. also true. Is that these these planes oh, right. are not not exactly coincident? That's a great point. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, so the next slide kind of shows the scale of these things. Um, Didymos there, of course, in the far right. Uh, Dimorphos Ooh. kind of in the middle. Dimorphos is about the size of one of the pyramids in Egypt. Um, Dart is here with its with its solar wing uh, solar panels extended is uh, a little bit bigger than a bus. Dart itself, if you don't count the solar panels, is we've been saying about the size of a vending machine. Um, that's not my favorite, and I'm going to give my favorite, even though Wayne is going to give me a look. Um, it's also about the size and mass. It's a little smaller than an average cow in size and mass. Uh, I like um, that unit. At least you're not using tennis courts like they do in JWST. Everything, yeah, no, no. Now, I guess primary mirrors are measured in units of tennis courts. So Yeah. <laughs> or at least heat shields are, or sun shields. Okay. And, and they're... They're Ouch. pretty close together. Everything, yeah, everything would fit. Um, basically, if you go to your local airport, uh, a reasonably big airport, but not a super big airport, everything would kind of fit on the scale of an airport. So you could easily walk from from Didymos to Morphos, uh, just looking for pretzels, probably. Um, <laughs> uh, so the next slide, and I think I handed over to Lena shortly. Oops, oh no, sorry. I'm sorry, back one up. So. Yeah. Um, Hang on. Yep. There. Oops. So no, you're going the wrong direction. Sorry. There we go. That's all good. So, um, like any mission, there are things that have to be done for NASA to consider us a success. These are the four things NASA need, that that DART needs to do uh, for us to be considered a success. We have to impact the Morphos. Uh, that's the latest department. Uh, we have to change the binary orbit period. That's just physics is physics is problem. If, if we do number one, we're confident about number two. Um, we have to measure the period change that is caused. That's now the investigation team's uh, uh, department. And then measure what we call beta uh, and characterize the impact site. So this is basically we're going to hit. We're going to hit with some momentum. How does that momentum that gets added to the system get translated into a change in momentum for Dimorphos? And I think that is the next slide, maybe. Or maybe momentum, number. Or maybe, momentum enhancement factor. I'm writing that down so I can ask. Yeah, momentum later. enhancement factor. Yeah. Uh, that's, okay. So the, the next slide. Yeah. Uh, yeah. This actually shows how we will make the measurements. Um, yeah. I just need to tell you that the little graph at the bottom doesn't uh, animate. I'm sorry, but this, all right. So that's, this, so that's cool. Uh, so yeah. As as the moon goes around, you can see that it moves behind. Uh, the main body. This is Dimorphos moving behind Didymos, and then it'll come out in front. It'll throw a shadow, and then it'll it'll block a little bit of the light of Didymos itself. The bottom trace shows what we would measure from Earth. They're too small, and even though they're close, they're too far away to be seen as more than a single point of light. As this stuff happens, the brightness of that point of light goes up and down, um, and we can measure the the frequency uh, of these these you know, the light going up and down, that tells us the orbit period. And then that uh, we measure that before, we measure that after, that tells us what, uh, how the period has changed and what DART has done to the system. Uh, the next slide then talks about um, this, uh, oh, there it this is. beta. 
And basically, if, uh, if we don't make any debris, if, if DART hits and, and that's all that happens, then momentum is conserved and beta, this factor, is one. Um, if, uh, depending on the, the situation, though, we expect to create debris, we expect DART to throw this debris into space, we expect that to actually in, increase the momentum change uh, over, over the original. So this, this could be an enhancement of a factor of two, it could be a factor of four, it could be a factor of like 20%. So we really don't know what this is gonna be and this would certainly affect, um, you know, if we had to do this for real, if we had to really deflect an asteroid, this, this uh, would be something we'd wanna know. And I think this is where I turn it over to Lena. Well, hang on a bit. Just again, I'm yeah. sorry. I uh, just want to. So, is there going to be something recording this impact from the outside to see the ejecta, or is this going to be something you're going to have to estimate from the force? Uh, the, you force is, the force or, is strong yeah. with us. You know, the force is it, it binds it. I forget what the force does. It's, <laughs> it's everywhere. Force, it's well, the force um, is hopefully going to move this asteroid. But uh, I guess I, I, how are you going to know what beta is uh, without? Are, the, whether or not you had ejecta, how are you going to know? So all of these affect the period change that we measure from Earth. So the larger the beta, the greater the period change, uh, okay. uh, which, is, which is what we're going to measure. And then there also will be something which I think Lena will talk about. There'll be uh, this oh, okay. tube that I Lena, mentioned will be on site. I'll let Lena go then because my questions are piling up. No, okay, the questions ahead. are good. So, okay, yep, Go ahead. Yeah, oh, Lena? All right. So can you I guys see, see my me? Alma in there? I'm just want to I'm very proud of the University of Colorado for being a partner. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, that's important because um, we have partners all over the world uh, uh, on this mission. You know, um, so our friendly planetary defense officer, Lindley Johnson, always says planetary defense is a global sport. Uh, so we're all in it together, and uh, DART is definitely a reflection of it. Uh, we built um, DART here at the Johns Hopkins Applied Physical Lab. I should say here, although I'm at the launch site at Vandenberg uh, Space Force Base, where we're actually launching DART off in uh, less than two weeks. So that's um, here is more global. Uh, but we do have partners all over the world. Uh, our, uh, so, of course, our launch vehicles are going to be SpaceX launch vehicle. And uh, we have the international partners from um, the um, Italian Space Agency that are providing a little CubeSat called Leechy Cube. That's what Andy talked about, something that is actually going to fly by the asteroid about um, three minutes after we impact. And it's actually going to take images of the ejection oh, of the oh, Earth. Okay. So um, it's not part of our level one requirements. We can figure out beta based on the fact of how much the orbit changed, right? And we're not going to be able to measure the mass of the asteroid uh, just because we will be destroyed once we hit. There are questions on the chat asking what's going to happen. Is the spacecraft going to be destroyed? The answer is yes. We are the thing that impacts the asteroid. We're moving at 15,000 miles per hour. Um, we are going to be gone. We're going to create a crater that's you know 10 to 20 meters or um, I should also translate into the uh, non-devil units of six and a half kilometers per second. Um, so uh, let's go to the next slide. So uh, DART is, you know, it's a technology demonstrator. We're not a science mission. It's a very different type of mission uh, that uh, NASA SMD is trying for this time. Uh, we are demonstrating a variety of technology. The most important thing uh, that we're demonstrating is uh, the ability to impact an asteroid. And just to give you an idea of how hard that is, uh, you're traveling 107 million miles to hit something that's 0.1 miles in size. So um, pretty small, uh, hard to see. Uh, most of the asteroids are dark. And uh, we're doing that using an optical uh, telescope called Draco. Uh, that's our only main instrument um, uh, shown here. It's based on the LORI instrument. I, I don't know if you guys saw pictures from the Pluto, Pluto flyby where LORI mm -hmm. took fantastic shots of Pluto. Oh, yeah. Well, so it's a camera based on that uh, that we're using for um, a DART as well. And that's what's going to find the asteroid. And I'll tell you a little bit about how it finds it in a few minutes. But um, the other big thing that we're demonstrating is the autonomous navigation uh, system, 
which is what once Draco actually locates the asteroid, that's what actually makes us impact. It guides ourselves in and we, the spacecraft becomes completely autonomous. I'll talk about that in a couple of minutes. And all of that is possible in our the type of avionics that we're actually flying in the spacecraft. But in addition to that, we're also demonstrating a lot of other technologies for NASA, such as the next ion propulsion engine, which is um, a much more exciting uh, ion engine uh, than previously flown. Uh, this one has a lot more throttability, which means you can go visit many more objects. We're not going to be doing that in this case. We're visiting one very particular asteroid. But for future missions, you can go and actually explore uh, many more objects with this um, engine. We also have a pancake uh, uh, antenna, uh, high gain antenna, uh, called the Radial Line Slot Array and a new type of solar array, which actually rolls out. Uh, we, it was demonstrated early on um, uh, at uh, NASA uh, on ISS, uh, but uh, we are actually the first mission that's actually flying it, and the first mission that actually is, is going to have it powered before it was just demonstrating the mechanism of the rolling out. So it is pretty exciting for us. And we have a little another little baby array on top of the larger solar array that has a bunch of concentrators. And that's really important for future missions that are going to go out to the outer solar system where you have very little light. And so you want to be able to make use of as much sunlight as possible and concentrate it on your solar cells. So pretty exciting stuff. All right, so uh, let's um, go to the next slide. So this is our dark spacecraft. Um, it is a box. Two by two by 2.6. Um, and once the roller arrays uh, roll out, uh, we're actually about 18 meters long. So pretty large. Uh, the solar arrays are basically flexible blankets that are attached to our spacecraft. What you also see is the Nexi engine on top of the uh, spacecraft, but uh, on the right, you see the engine actually undercover because we have to protect it. It has a lot of high voltage stuff. And when it's sitting in the, uh, in the fairing at launch, lots of stuff could write down on it. Our uh, uh, Draco telescope is actually is inside uh, the main spacecraft and has a cover as well. And then Leachy CubeSat is sitting on the side there. All right, let's go to the next slide. So uh, here's a little uh, light Italian CubeSat for imaging of the asteroids. You know, we all love our acronyms, uh, so Leachy Cube. Uh, for a while, we were calling it Selfie Sat, which was kind of cool, because that's really oh, what it yeah. is, right? It's going to take a selfie of us as we slam into the asteroid. Um, yeah, however, NASA decided to not go with Selfie Sat, and uh, here we are with Leachy Cube, but also a good name. So um, it's a... Pretty cool uh, little CubeSat, it has two cameras and both of those are going to image us after uh, we hit. And it is actually going to outlive DART because, um, uh, and you know, it's a really fun CubeSat. Uh, usually with CubeSats, you um, take, you attach them to your spacecraft and you let them go um, as soon as possible, right? The moment you launch, they you kind of let go. We actually are carrying it at 10 months to the asteroid with us and uh, are going to let it go about 10 days prior to um, uh, prior to us impacting. And we're letting it go behind us because if we don't, we A, we don't want to slam into it. And then B, we want to make sure that it's actually um, uh, flies by after we hit. If we go to the next slide. So after it flies by, it downlinks data for the next six hours, uh, six, uh, six months, uh, because it has a very small data rate. So, but for us, our biggest thing is really uh, our Draco camera. Um, and uh, you can see it here with the door open, looking out into the world. And it's really basically our eyes to the solar system. And in particular, for searching for the Didymos asteroid and Dimorphos as well. So if we go to the next slide. Because you know, um, uh, you know, Hubble had one of those camera covers and they never opened it or they, after they opened it once, they never closed it again. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, no, we're not planning to close it. This is a one time opening cover. The moment it opens, it stays open. Uh, this is really to protect us um, from debris in the launch vehicle, because let's be honest, all the launch vehicle fairings are pretty dirty and yeah. having a sensitive optical instruments where we actually want to make sure it's really clean uh, before we launch. Um, it's important to have a cover. So, um, so we really are going to be searching for uh, the Didymos uh, system uh, about 30 days prior to our arrival. Um, 
So that's the first time we're actually going to see it. Um, what we know about Didymos right now, I think somebody asked uh, in the chat earlier, what do we know about the asteroids right now? Well, quite little actually, but also quite a lot. Um, this particular asteroid we've been observing for about 20 years in 2003, there was a close approach of that asteroid to Earth and we were able to get some um, using uh, uh, ground-based radar observations. Uh, we were able to at least get a good shape of Didymos, which is the bigger asteroid, right? It's the one that's 780 meters size. And um, also the investigation team has been doing a fantastic job observing it for the last couple of years and trying for engineers to get us a good understanding of where exactly Dimorphos is in relationship to the larger asteroid. And in particular, looking at all the different um, light curves of how um, Dimorphos is passing around Didymos. And uh, also, uh, we have some good ideas. You know, there were some spectral observations of the Didymos as well that give us a good feeling of what kind of asteroid it is. And it's really, it's, uh, it's not the most, you know, it's not a metallic asteroid. It's, um, it is a, on the chondrite family, which is, I think, and Andy can correct me because sometimes I lie. Um, Andy, uh, it's one of the more uh, common uh, families of the asteroid. And we want to say a couple of more words on that. Sure. And, and you don't lie. You sometimes maybe are misspeak. But um, <laughs> the, uh, the, this particular kind of composition is a very, very common meteorite type. It's, it's the most commonly found, seen to fall to Earth. So it's very typical of what's out there. It's the same composition that Apophis has. It's the same composition that Eros had and Itakawa had. So it's, it's very common. Yeah. So, I mean, I think it's really good for us to be able to hit something that is very common to what we might actually expect in the real planetary defense situation. And I think that's what makes this Didymos binary system such an ideal target. Well, in addition to being extremely safe, because, you know, there's always a question, oh, you're going to hit Dimorphos and you're going to knock it out of the orbit and then it's going to come barreling towards Earth. Well, the answer is no, not really possible. Um, uh, but more to that later. So um, composition, uh, we know uh, we have a pretty good idea of what Didymos is made out of. But the problem is, is that we don't really know what Dimorphos is like. Can you go to the next slide? Uh, so we only know about Dimorphos very little. We, we kind of know its size, its basic size. We know how often it rotates about Dimorphos. Thanks to the investigation team, now we know um, which side it's at, at what time. Um, in its orbital period, because that's really important because we're trying to go hit it when it's farthest away from the main asteroid, because then we can actually see it earlier. And uh, But we don't really know it. And um, when you're trying to hit something that is dark uh, and you don't know its shape and you don't see it until about 30 minutes before you hit, um, at that point, you know, an hour out to uh, 30 minutes is the first time where it's actually one pixel in front of our camera, um, it is a pretty hard mission to do. So if we go to the next slide. Yeah, so this is just kind of a, a little bit of a explanation of how we actually target uh, Dimorphos over time. So, you know, 30 days, as I said, we first detected, then uh, about 10 days out, we finally get uh, continuous uh, ground station coverage. So DSN, which is what we're using to talk to the spacecraft, is on with us all the time, together with ESTRAC, uh, the European Space Agency uh, dishes. And, um, and then uh, last 10 days, we're just performing maneuvers, trying to get ourselves as closely possible, um, guiding ourselves towards Didymos, which is the main asteroid. And then at four hours out before we hit, uh, the space car becomes fully autonomous. Uh, the smart nav guiding system completely kicks in. Which, what does that mean? That means that now the space car performs all of the maneuvers itself. It's sending video back to Earth, streaming video basically of Dimorphos. And then we watch paint dry for about you know three and a half hours. Um, so if we go to the next slide. So the last um, hour is when, for the first time, we see the asteroid, hour to 30 minutes, depending on the model that we use. And then um, really, once we're finally at about four minutes out, you can see we're finally starting to see the shape of Dimorphos. And then in four minutes, we slam into it. So there's really not much time to react. 
Um, and um, we better be right the first time. <laughs> so um, if we go to the next slide. So okay. in the last, uh, and you can just let this go, it's going to play automatically. These are some, you know, oh, you have to I show some it. exciting pictures uh, of the spacecraft being built up. You know, it's uh, always really hard uh, to build a spacecraft, but in this case, it was particularly hard because we were doing it during COVID. Uh, however, um, that, that was, uh, and you have to touch spacecraft in order to be, you can't just be on the Zoom meeting. Um, so we've been coming in for the last year and a half, uh, building up the spacecraft. It's gone through a lot of testing on the ground, uh, doing thermal vacuum. You know, uh, we uh, received our solar arrays. There's Draco being integrated. We tested uh, our spacecraft um, and uh, were able to shake it because, of course, on the ground you have to simulate the shaking of the rocket and then how, what thermal cycles is going to go through in space because you know space is really cold or really hot depending which way you're faced uh leachy cube got integrated onto the spacecraft if you go to the next slide i think the the animation probably stalled out but um yeah so this is our leachy cube with our italian colleagues who visited here and then if you go to the next slide yeah. yeah, so you can see the spacecraft actually right before we shipped, all beautiful uh, yes, and ready. Is spacecraft the only people that use Captan? You see, that's the only place I ever see it. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, it, it does look not all that it shines as gold, I guess, but in this case, the spacecraft is very shiny. <laughs> yeah, I love it, man. It's the only yeah. place I ever see that stuff. Yep. No. So here's a blanket. So if you go through the next couple of slides, I think maybe the animation is not uh, as no, good. No, I'm just doing it manually. It, it okay. Won't. Yeah. Just kind of skip through them. Uh, you can see we shipped to Vandenberg and then we arrived at SpaceX uh, recently um, uh, where we uh, were basically getting ready for launch. We filled up our spacecraft with hydrazine and uh made it uh mating to the adapter today actually i'm uh, watching it right now um happen uh in the clean room no, i had to step out for this but um yeah. yeah and then in less than two weeks we're going to um go ahead and launch and then so if you go to the next, last slide oh, oh okay. here we go Does oh, the animation the work? yes let's do that oh, yeah, yeah i'll show you that you ready to show it i'm ready oh okay. yeah let's do it all right i gotta do uh, so you're gonna put you're gonna put the trailer on all right yeah yeah so let yeah, me yeah the trailer uh, is uh what you will what see happened. is what happens right after we launch so kind of the 10 months in a very short duration of a minute okay you ready here it goes yep and it does make some beautiful music it shows us deploying rolling out of the solar rays opens the Draco door turning on the Nexi engine That's there you so go. Cool, Holy and the crap. tasteful, yeah, the tasteful cut at the end, so you don't have to see the see the carnage. Oh, the carnage! <laughs> Come on, this is the exciting That's part. That's the best part, man. That's true, but it was a tasteful. It was a tasteful cut, you know. Yeah, yeah. it was a moment of here it comes to you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so theaters uh, next to you next. Uh, if we launch on the first day of our launch period um, on September twenty sixth next year, we're going to impact. How confident are you about the launch going off on schedule? The space guys, the SpaceX guys, seem to have this down now. So uh, they do, they really do. And actually, we're looking pretty good for the first day of the launch period right now. And I want to knock on wood or something because <laughs> you know plastic this. right around me. Yeah. So, but um, it's looking pretty good. It uh, actually they have a saying at Vandenberg is which is Vandy doesn't slip. So. Um, hopefully, uh, they, most of their launches go off on the first try. Okay, but here's what I want to know. Have, have you guys told 
NASA that you're planning on crashing this thing? I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> it I'm is the best course, job in the world to crash, know. you know, a $250 million spacecraft. I mean, <laughs> yeah, they, they love it. Crash something. <laughs> they love it because they know we're not going to come back for an extended mission request. Oh, yeah. that's right. <laughs> they love it. They're yeah. kind of a victim of their own success, aren't they? Every time they do a mission, five years. Five years, nominal. Exactly. Nominal, maybe extended to 10 right. years. Right. The rover, the rover folks keep coming back 90 days. It's 14 years later. We're, we're, <laughs> yeah, we're not yeah. going to do that. The Voyager folks, right? 40 some odd uh, years later. Yeah. Are you still asking for money? So, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's great. So, I, for one, am really glad that this mission is out there because I, I think the NEO effort, that NASA has going both with Neowise and with uh, now with Dart, and uh, also there's some Apophis stuff I think that might be planned. Um, that you know I think all of this is vitally important. Of course, Osiris Rex and and things and getting bringing back some Bayou. So all of this I think is among the most important things that NASA does. And and I gotta say the public agrees. I've mentioned that at the top of this hangout. The the two things that the general public want NASA to do the most is study climate change and study these asteroids. It's funny, human ex ex exploration is way down the list. So this is important stuff. Everybody's interested in it, and um, I guess is this really? Uh, a, you, this is a pathfinder for a lot of different technologies. You've already shown us the different things you're going to be testing out on here. Um, would there be? Do you think based on the however big beta ends up being uh would you be doing larger re re redirect attempts or is that just too far down the road to think about right now you just want to get this done andy do you want to start yeah so i think in terms of um you know like one of the the slides that deepak showed near the start there's this kind of you know national strategy so to speak and um or not even so to speak there is a national strategy and so uh, this is the the start of a mitigation test, right? It's, it's testing this out. I could imagine, and I saw one of the questions in the chat, um, following up, a, a, follows a natural, a natural follow-up to DART would be saying, okay, instead of hitting something this size of this composition, that's a moon, maybe try to hit something that's on its own, something that is metallic, something that's a little bigger. Could we send two in a row, you know, successfully? Uh, but there are other mitigation techniques that are also under consideration, something like the gravity. Oh, oh, no, we lost Andy. Lost Andy. He just All right, so Andy, so Andy okay, can join I can on continue his, I, can uh, I can continue his train of thought. So there oh, could okay. be other uh, things that one can think of, uh, different mitigation strategies. Strategy. And, 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 <laughs> Sorry, oh, maybe, maybe that All was right. good. That was the universe cutting me off. Something like the gravity tractor, which we didn't talk about. There are other techniques, you know, that could be tried. Back to you, Lena. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I was going to say <laughs> there are other techniques, right, uh, that could be tried. And, uh, uh, you know, smart people in planetary defense have thought of a lot of different techniques that people are trying um, to figure out a way of testing them. And also just, you know, it depends on the size of an asteroid. There are different techniques that would actually be more applicable. Uh, for really small asteroids, um, maybe a FEMA effort would actually be more applicable than trying to uh, get um, a mission into the into flight and try to actually divert it because it would be really hard to find. And then for larger asteroids, um, you need so much mass uh, in order to imp uh, and depending where it is in the orbit, you need so much mass and how much uh, uh, change in the orbit you can create. Uh, you might want something that's a little bit different, either like laser ablation. I mean, that technique has been talked about. Nuclear, where you detonate a nuclear weapon, not at the asteroid like an Armageddon, because that's crazy. But <laughs> because you have other pieces of chunks of the asteroid that are still going to continue towards Earth, right? Um, what uh, people have talked about uh, setting up an explosion, a controlled explosion that's actually nearby the asteroid, and the shock wave from the explosion would actually move it out of its way. So there are different techniques that people are thinking about, but I think that uh, kinetic impact is just one of them. And go ahead, Deepak. Yeah, so th these are all different different techniques. Now, the way that this, these missions get selected, I think the question was, what's what is next? And one of the missions that's on the on the books for being next is actually the near Earth object surveillance mission. And we talked about those those five different points. What what Lena and Andy have been talking about is that that middle point, goal number three, is deflection and disruption. Uh, but there's the detection side of things. So we want to we want to launch this surveillance mission so we could actually find all those asteroids that we don't know about. 
then the question is, you know, well, what happens next and what happens next? There's actually a, a process called the decadal survey that NASA oh, yes. follows. Yeah, when when it, it's not yeah, so these missions aren't like a bunch of rogue scientists saying it's like, hey, wouldn't it be cool if we did this and you know let's spend a whole lot of money there? No, it's 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 actually a very <laughs> yeah, right. It's, it's not like Hunger Games for for money to build sat the satellites, you know. It's you know, there, it's a it, there's a process that you know we yeah. get the community okay. together and we decide collectively, you know, what is the right place to put all of our money, and once the community sets that course of direct the scientific community sets that course. NASA will try to appropriate funds as pop, as uh, appropriate to uh, to make those happen. However, no, it did not come about that way, nor yeah. did the uh, NEOSM, which is the second planetary defense mission. So this oh. is the first time that planetary defense is actually in the decadal service. In the decadal, right. So for, for yeah. going, going forward, well, there's going to be a more formal process. It's exactly. a reflection not only of what scientists want, but the, the people too. So this is, I think it's it dovetailed nicely with the, with the decadal survey. Yeah, so. I'll, I'll also say just, just real quick, that it's, um, I think we, you know, as, as noted, planetary defense is an international issue, and Didymos itself will be visited by a European spacecraft a couple of years after uh, after DART. Uh, the Hera mission has been approved by the European Space Agency. It's oh, going to fly. It's going to come and kind of do the do the assessment afterwards, the after after after, after action assessment you know, and say, okay, how big of a crater was made, you know, make some measurements that DART cannot make. So that is a definite um, direct follow-up to DART that one of our, that our colleagues in Europe are going to be carrying out. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, I, I want to get to some questions because we're running out of time and I haven't gotten to very many. Um, uh, this is from Hans Milling. So is the spacecraft going to be swallowed or will it fly right through? Most likely swallowed. At least all of our, um, all of our models so far predict that it's going to be swallowed. Unless that yeah. asteroid, yeah, is completely yeah, you can, on a sand. Well, you can, and you can imagine. I mean, people, you can stand on a on a pile of sand or a pile of gravel. Um, the 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 spacecraft is only a few hundred kilograms, and as long as it encounters more than its mass on the way through, it's going to be stopped. And these these you know rocks are much 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 more massive than the spacecraft. Okay, and uh, Dan Dan uh, from Canada is asking. Um, is there a variation in speed among asteroids as they approach Earth? They all seem to be moving very fast. <laughs> yeah, there's there's a uh, if you're in an orbit around the sun, then there's kind of a minimum speed you're going to have when you're at, at one AU, and it's about twenty to thirty kilometers a second. So there's a little bit of variation, but but there's that. And then the Earth's gravity also makes it so that there's a minimum speed that things hit the Earth with, which is the same as the escape speed. Actually, it's just going in the other direction. So it goes okay. from fast to really fast is the answer. Yeah, yeah. Um, AB wants to know if we're going to harvest asteroids. Well, DART's not, but uh, what do you <laughs> think about that question for the future? Um, yeah, I keep taking all these. I don't know if anyone else has an opinion. No, uh, I, I, you know, there's always, uh, there are all the companies out there that are talking about harvesting asteroids, and there are definitely a lot of materials, but it's very hard to, it's very hard to make it cheap to go into space. And uh, sometimes it's actually just not worth it economically. Imagine your launch costs you $50 million. So you have to harvest a lot to in order to be able to make up for that. Make it worthwhile. So yeah. the, the whole, yeah. the, I think that'll all start off on the moon first. You know, once we start with, with Artemis yeah. and this, this whole lunar exploration thing that we have going on, which is you know another one of the great things that's been going on since the pandemic started, we've been accelerating actually through that. The whole the whole aspect of in situ resource utilization. You know, if we're going to be building stuff on the moon, we need to use resources from the moon because we can't. As Lena was saying, it's it's cost prohibitive to just launch everything there. So I think it'll start at that point, and then maybe maybe the space mining industry will grow. Mm -hmm. We'll see. It's inevitable. Yeah. We're going to exploit nowhere. So uh, here's from Hans again. What's the latency in the video signal? About thirty eight seconds. Uh, let's see. About thirty-eight seconds. It's a very precise number. So. <laughs> yeah, wow, I know. Yeah, it travels at the speed of, at the speed of light. So you know, John Suffolk is giving us some background here. Didymos is the Greek word for twin, and dimorphos is Greek for having two forms. Some of those scientists are brainy. You guys know what you're doing. We, we can be poetic at times. Well, yeah. uh, actually, for I I, I want to give credit for our amazing team because uh, for a long time engineers called the Didymos A and Didymos B. 
So Demorphos is a very new name to us about a year ago, um, right? Uh, and that was a really beautiful suggestion to have it called Demorphos. How fortuitous is that, that you that we're doing this on a bi How many of these kind of systems do you think are out there? These sort of binary revolt, you know, one gravitationally yeah. bound asteroids. Yeah, yeah. Ab about 10 to 15 percent of, of well, asteroids, we think, in that size range are binaries. But the trick for DART was that um, it had to be aligned in a way that it was moving in front of it and back. So you could make the measurements from the ground if it was kind of oriented like this, then that would be no good. Um, yeah. Plus, the moon had to be small enough that you could move it with uh, with something the size of DART. Plus, it had to be coming by the Earth uh, in a time frame that, that we could make the measurements. So, Didymos was really the only choice for this mission. Yeah. Well, you'll be surprised to learn that God watches this. And, and, why, and why he doesn't already know the answer to this question, I don't know. But... Uh, uh, he goes, I'm I know I'm referring back to the start of the talk, but why are we just thinking about near-Earth objects? What about if one of the auric cloud has been kicked in? Could we see it, let alone nudge it? you think God would know this, but I'll let you go. Yeah. So, uh, again, I, I feel like I'm, I'm kind of monopolizing here. I do have an answer, but if either of you two want to... Uh, you want to go? No, that go no actually, uh, I need to drop off um, okay, for um, another activity it's, it's in the clean time, room. So. Sorry. Yes. I'm going to uh, head out, and so hey. Andy can really monopolize it now. <laughs> Thank you for taking time out to be here. Godspeed. Have a good one. Everything goes well on the launch uh, later Thank this you, morning. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. See you guys. Glad you could join Bye -bye. us. Yes. Thank you. So the, the uh, studies, yeah, the studies that looked at the danger uh, to to humanity of asteroid impact, you know, did it in like an actuarial way of you know statistically looking at this is the number of deaths per year caused by this over such and such period of time and near-earth asteroids were uh the bulk of the danger and in fact that's kind of been what set these different size ranges for the searches um so once we find 90 percent of the 140 meter objects are larger that will retire a whole bunch of risk and then it does become the the or cloud objects that are going to be the most uh the most dangerous remaining unknown objects whether that leads to a search for those or not, those are really hard to look for. But but that that is the reason. I know I I, I want to respect your time, and I'm going to let you go. I'm going to I'm going to close out with serial port. Um, how long will you be monitoring the expected change in orbit, the period I guess of the orbit around of uh, Didymos? Um, how we'll long be, after you come past it? Yeah, well, well, Didymos will be easily observable. Uh, well, we'll be observable from the ground-based telescopes through spring of 2023. I'm sure we'll be looking at it through then. Uh, then it won't be observable for another couple of years. So I'm sure we'll look back when we get the chance and then Hera will show up. So um, kind of the immediate plans are through spring of 2023 and then, uh, and then we take a break. Okay. Well, uh, Deepak Srinivasan and Andy Rifkin, uh, Thank you guys for taking time out. Also, Elena, Elena Adams, she was also uh, here with us. Thank you guys for taking time out to talk with us about the DART mission. I'm excited. I'm sure we're going to be all checking out the, the, the launch and the telemetry as it comes in. Um, will you guys be reporting next year as it approaches, kind of like what they did with the Cyrus Rex, or is it going to be an after-the-fact kind of thing to be learned about? You know how when they were going towards Bainu, we kind of kind of got updates relatively quickly after they occurred? Is that going to be something you're planning for, or will it be... Much later. Yeah, it, it'll it'll be an event. You know, you'll you'll see a lot of buildup leading up to this, leading up to the uh, you know the, the eventual impact. Um, and you know, you can follow us on dart.jhuapl.edu. I think there we go. Briefly flew up on, on on the screen. So you know, you it, there'll be updates constantly posted on there. Plus, there'll be hopefully a, a greater amount of events such as this. You know, Tony, yes. would yes. we'd love to be back here, and you know, and that build up up to the impact. It'll be great. You know, yes, yes, so. let's do that. I'm I'm ready. I am ready. We'll do it. Anything do you want to do, I'll make myself available. So let's let, I would love to to help you guys and talk about this some more. So let's No, it's great that your program and just, just in general getting getting the public involved and you know we, we just want this to to touch everybody. You know, it's an exciting mission. I encourage everybody to check out the website, uh, dart.huapl.edu. There's actually a little quiz on there called Planetary Defender. We can see whether or not you guys are paying attention to this talk, and you can earn a badge to be a planetary. Join us as planetary defenders. I encourage you all to do that. 
Oh, and uh, qualification involved. Okay. That's right. That's right. <laughs> it, it, it's actually a test of us. Did we do our job well enough to inform you guys so you can pass the test? Right. So we'll see. All right. Well, thank you guys so much. All right. Well, so on behalf of my guests, I want to thank you. And I want to thank the American Astronom uh, Astronautical Society. Thank you for, for making these possible. Please check them out, uh, the, double, the American Astronautical Society, and consider becoming a member because they do some important work and their members are out doing exciting stuff like this. So uh, just want to astronautical.org is their, is their website. So thank you. Uh, guys for helping make this possible. So I guess I'll see you guys on Tuesday where we'll be talking more about the Decadal Survey. And thank you so much for watching. And as always, keep looking up.